I understand uh, the ladies that were here yesterday, it was an awesome women's meeting. How many of you ladies? Yeah, so the first monthly women's meeting kicked off yesterday. It was a good one, so uh, awesome there. All right, I'm going to jump in this new series, four weeks, just this month of October, called This We Believe. And so I want to go over some core orthodox value, uh, principles and theological values of the faith, okay? Does that sound good to everybody? And so uh, what I'm going to look at specifically, I'm going to break into four parts but not get too deep into it, uh, is the Nicene Creed. And I want to look at uh, God's kingdom, Jesus, salvation, and power. Now, some of you may not even know what the Nicene Creed is, okay? Well, the Nicene Creed was something that was first formulated in about 325, <clears throat> excuse me, A.D. in Constantinople, which is now modern-day <clears throat> Instantinople, and then later, it was kind of, there was some additions to it in 381 ADD and, and 451 uh, AD at another council. But here's the thing about the creeds. We are not, just to, just to be clear, in case some of you are getting nervous right now, we're not a creedal church, okay? There are churches that are creedal, like, for example, Catholic Church or Episcopalian um, Lutheran, those are what would be known as creedal church. That said, there are principles from the creeds that are, that are good for us in our modern times. <clears throat> Again, excuse me, I had a little bit of something going on this week, so I might have a, a voice thing going on. But there are things that, uh, that we can glean from the creeds that will help us understand our faith. Does this make sense? And so part of the reason that the creeds came about, like uh, the Nicene Creed, later the Apostles' Creed, uh, for example, it's a statement of the Orthodox faith of the early Christian church in opposition to certain heresies. Now, these heresies disturbed the church during the 4th century and concerned primarily the doctrine of the Trinity and the person of Christ. And so both the Greek or Eastern church and the Latin Western church uh, held this creed in honor, though there was one very important difference, and I'll explain that here in a couple of weeks, uh, this issue of the Holy Spirit and ho who, how the Holy Spirit proceeds. The Western Church, or what later became the Roman Catholic Church, believes the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and Son, whereas the Greek Church believes the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, okay? So I know I'm getting a little deep on you this morning. It'll make more sense here in a minute. Is everybody good? All right, so let me just read you the creed, and then I want to look at today... What, God, what it means, this first part of it, God's kingdom, it's about Father, but it's about God's kingdom. So the creed goes like this. And again, the reason they, they had these creeds was to combat the heresy. Remember, the printing press didn't come along until almost another thousand years, right? And so the, the canon of Scripture or the Bible that we know it was finished around the 4th, 5th century, but it would be a thousand years later before you had the printing, printing press and you get widely distributed the Bible, Right? So they had to have a way, the early church fathers, to help believers know what the fundamental values of the faith were. Does it make sense? And so along came the creeds. All right, so let's read it. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father, which I believe is correct, with the Eastern view, but the Western view added, and the Son. And with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. 
He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic. This is not the Roman Catholic Church, by the way. Catholic means universal. So when they wrote this, they meant in one holy universal and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. And you're all going to memorize this creed this week, right? All right. But you, can you see the value? Imagine if you were alive in the fourth century and you didn't have a Bible or access to scrolls, right? Wouldn't this have been helpful for you to know what we believe as Christians, right? And so let's break this down a little bit. So again, I want to just look at the first part. Uh, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. And I want to talk about what it means about God's kingdom today. Does that sound good? All right, let's first talk about what God's original intent in uh, the creation of earth and everything we know and creation of humanity. What was God's intent then for humanity and creation? Basically, God's original intent was for humanity to walk in relationship with God and steward over his creation. We were created in the image of God, clothed with a material vehicle or natural body. We are a spirit like unto him with understanding, will, and liberty. Now, there's a Latin phrase, imago Dei, or which means image of God. It means in likeness or similarity to God. Humans are created with unique abilities, absent in all other creatures of the earth that mirror the divine nature of God. I'm giving you a lot of theology here today, is that all right? I'll write this up this week in my article. You can read it later. Some of you are going, please, Pastor, don't kill us today. Okay, okay, you'll be all right, all right? Hang in there. The phrase, image of God, has its origins in Genesis 1.27, where it says God created man in his own image. Now, again, let me just give you a little more definition of this. This biblical passage does not imply that God is in human form, but that humans are in the image of God in their moral, spiritual, and intellectual essence. Thus, humans reflect God's divine nature and their ability to achieve the unique characteristics with which they have been gifted. These unique qualities make humans different than all other creatures, rational understanding, creative liberty, the capacity for self-actualization, and the potential for self-transcendence. In other words, to elevate oneself in the spirit in God. All right, so... Let me start to get more practical here and breaking this down. So that gives you a little bit of an idea that what the, the, the scope of this image of God is and how we are in this place with God. Now, before the fall, again, God's desire in that humanity would steward with him over creation, God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, and it was there he would come and speak with them. God gave them dominion and authority over all creation Man was God's vice regent on planet Earth. Genesis 1.28 says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And so when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they forfeited the authority God gave them and were removed from the garden. Sin entered humanity and affected creation and planet Earth. Now, though Adam and Eve sinned, God never lost control of the ownership of Earth. This is a very important point, right? And so Psalm 24, verse 1, for example, says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it the world, and all who live in it. Who owns the earth? The Lord. Lord. Has he ever lost control of it? No. No. It's very important to understand that. So despite the fall, this earth domain God gave or assigned to humanity. Remember, we're created in his image. He's given us a natural vehicle called this human body, but we have the ability to think like God, to be in the realm of the spirit like God, right? 
to have God's ideas, God's values, to be able to hear the voice of God. And so he's given us what we need then if we learn how to listen to him and follow him to do what he's asked in terms of stewarding over this earth domain. And so even though the fall of man had uh, happened, uh, again, God didn't relinquish ownership of the earth, but he had already assigned humanity the responsibility of governing it. And so, again, because we're in his image, he made us capable of governing it. Does this make sense? We have this ability because God made us in his image to govern over it. And so, and this principle is true even after the fall in the garden. That's why uh, you can see people throughout the course of human history. Sometimes some of the most creative people, they're not necessarily even followers of Christ, right? But God will still use them ideas he gives them because they're still in the image of God. Now, this runs contrary to some, to some sects of Christianity that want to see man is so totally depraved that there is nothing good in man at all. It's true. We have a sin nature. Absolutely. We have fallen because of Adam. We need a Savior. That's Jesus Christ, right? There is no way to the Father but through Jesus Christ. He is the propitiation for our sins. He died on that cross, shed his blood, so you and I could be forgiven and be made right with God. Absolutely, that is true. But yet, there is this element of the image of God that's in us, if you will, enough of the goodness of God that actually draws us to him even when we're unsaved. Does this make sense? Some have called it prevenient grace. It's a drawing. It's enough of the grace of God to draw us to him. And so... Uh, Look at Psalm 115, 16. I like this verse here. It says, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given, or Moffat's translation says, assigned to the children of men. So God owns the earth, but who has he assigned it to? Humanity. So you and I have a responsibility over planet earth, okay? And so, but that's not just in terms of the natural elements, it's over this earthly realm, right, to influence this world. Now, again, as I said earlier at the transition from worship, God has never lost control over the earth. Whether it's a, a, a world war, economic chaos, pandemics, or any situation, during darkness, God is loving, merciful, and long-suffering. He never stops to be the loving father that is always trying to draw humanity to him through his son, Jesus Christ. Because God is not willing that any would perish, right? But that all would come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. This is the good news of the gospel. And this is the hope that we have throughout the ages, right? Now, some wonder if God is good, why is there evil in the world? Well, the answer is we live in a fallen world where there are two kingdoms at war with each other. God's kingdom of light and Satan's kingdom of darkness. They are opposed to God's purpose of reconciliation and restoration of humanity. The enemy and the powers of darkness from the very onset of tempting Adam and Eve in the garden, getting them to eat of a of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil instead of the tree of life, right? Trying to, to pull them into a place of, of corruption. The enemy still tries to do that. He wants to pull us off track. He wants to pull us away from God. He wants to destroy humanity in whatever way he can. And that's why and we see at times just this horrific things that we even do one to another as human beings, right? And again, we're witnessing it firsthand right now in the news with another war that's broken out, right? And so this is just the reality. But God's desire is that his kingdom of light, of love, of his mercy, of his grace, and his goodness would have preeminence over everything, right? And so the more that we, his people, or the church, represent him in that way and steward over it, we begin to affect the atmosphere, not only of our, our lives, or churches, but over our cities and our nations. Does it make sense? Now, let's define the kingdom of God. Again, we're, I'm trying to break this down from the Nicene Creed here. Again, I'll read that first part. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, right? And of his kingdom, there is, will never end, right? Okay, so let's talk about 
um, uh, his kingdom a little bit more here. The English word kingdom translates from a Greek word, basalia, which means first, the authority to rule as a king, and second, the realm over which the reign is exercised. Essentially, the rule of God is supreme and his realm over which he reigns, the universe and again in all of creation. Let me give you a couple scriptures. Daniel 2.37, you, O king, are king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. So the very rule, the authority, the sovereignty of the king. Psalm 103, verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. He's never lost control of planet Earth, even after the fall. He's not lost control right now, this very moment. His kingdom rules over all. Psalm 145, 13. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And your dominion endures throughout all generations. God's kingdom is everlasting. His rule over all never ceases. Now, this I'm trying to really build your faith right now. And by the way, I was pulling this message together before war broke out this week in Israel, okay? His kingdom rules over all, all the time, irrespective of current events, okay? We may think of the kingdom as primarily God's realm, but it is first his authority. He has authority as the creator. All right? So it's his kingdom realm that he created, but it's his authority. Now, Jesus defined what God's kingdom was and how it was being revealed. Historically, the Jews thought that the Messiah would come and establish the Jewish kingdom again, much like what David had done, King David. So when Jesus came, he was rejected by the religious leaders because a political kingdom wasn't initiated. But both John the Baptist and Jesus declared something else. Uh, Matthew 3, 2. You see something similar in Matthew 4, 17. But let's just look at Matthew 3, 2. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand literally means pressing in upon me. Now, the New Testament mentions the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven about 80 times in the Gospels. Let's look at another verse. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, preaching the gospel from a Greek word, euangelion, of the kingdom. It means it's at hand again or pressing in upon me. It literally, gospel means the inbreaking of God into this world. And it's from the the Greek Septuagint, Isaiah 40, verse 9. The authority of Christ completes this kingdom message. Jesus came to usher in or inaugurate the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God was already present, but he was then beginning to make everyone aware of what was already a reality, right? Because he on earth was representing the Father's will, and when he went to the cross, died, and he reconciled all things, Paul would later say in Romans that Christ, our second, the second Adam. And so he's restored, and I'll get to this more in a minute, what the first Adam had lost, right? And so Jesus was giving them not only a message, but a demonstration. I'll build this more when I talk about Jesus more next week, right? So every word Jesus did, what did he do? He preached about the gospel, proclaimed that it's breaking in upon them to repent and get right with God, right? But then he also did what? He healed the sick, raised the dead, someone said. He cleansed the lepers, cast out demons, Open up blind eyes, come on. Our brother sitting here had a blind eye open, come on, right? Right, this this is the works of the kingdom. And those works haven't gone away. Amen. 
maker of heaven and earth, Lord Almighty, of his kingdom there is no end. If there's no end to his kingdom, there should be no end to the works of the kingdom. Now, how do we enter this kingdom? Mark 10, 15, Mark said this, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. That was Jesus. Mark recorded it. So how do we enter the kingdom of God? Through humility. We receive God's kingdom. Entrance into God's kingdom and family occur through faith in Christ. We repent of our sin. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Again, why the creed is important, understanding the principles of the faith. We believe that Jesus came to earth, took on human flesh, born of a virgin, died on a cross, shed his blood so we could be restored to the Father, that we're now, in, when we put our faith in him, that we have hope of resurrection life, and that we'll be with him forever in, in immortality. Does that make sense? And so when we reach that place and we say, okay, God, I want, I want to get saved. Or I want to get my life right with you. Jesus, I believe you died for me. Jesus, I open my life to you. I surrender my way of life. I turn from my old life, and I give you my life. Amen? And that's how we enter the kingdom. I want to ask you, can you remember when you received Christ in humility, how that changed your life? Can you remember that day? Just think for a moment. How did your life change? And if you're here today and you've not ever done that, it, listen, it's, it's simple. Someone will pray with you at the end. It's just a matter of saying, Lord, I believe, and Lord, I want you to be in my life, and I want to follow you, Jesus. Enter my life. Fill me with your spirit. Wash me with your blood. Forgive me of my sin. I believe that you died, rose again, and you're coming again, Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's talk a little bit about what Jesus recovered. I got good news for you today. I'm going to get done early. They got me up here early today. Jesus recovered what was lost in the garden. That, that is unless God interrupts somehow, and I just keep going. Okay. <laughs> Jesus recovered what was lost in the garden. This is a very important thing, and I want to build on this some more next week. He is reconciling all things and is returning all things to their original state, all right? It's partial and progressive until the second coming of Christ. His finished work on the cross is accomplished. It's done. In this sense, he has reconciled all things, yet we have a free will. So that's why it's partial and progressive, and he is reconciling all things. In other words, do you think you're perfectly complete and in the image of Christ right now? Do you believe you're being conformed to the image of Christ? Now, do you believe positionally that you're already the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Absolutely. See, so in that sense, it's already done, and yet we're still becoming. Does that make sense? That's why it says that he has become for us our holiness, yet we're also to be holy as I am holy, he would say. That's right. So in one sense, it's positional what Christ has already done. That's an accomplished reality, accomplished fact. And that's why we can always have courage to run back to the Father no matter what mess we get into. And say, okay, God, I made a mistake here. God, I come back to you. Lord, will you forgive me of this or forgive me of this sin? Will you let your blood cleanse me and forgive me and wash that away, God? And he says, yes and amen. That's why the scripture says we can come boldly under the throne of grace, whereby we can obtain grace and mercy to help in our time of need. Hebrews 4.16. When do we need his grace and mercy? When everything's going great? all the time, but especially in our time of need, right? right? One of the scriptures I like, this little segue here, Psalm 50, verse 15, says, call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will answer you and glorify and deliver you. I will answer you and deliver you and glorify my name. What a promise. I memorized that one a long time ago. It's so comforting to know that you can be in the midst of a storm, whether someone else created or circumstances created or maybe your own situation, 
And yet you can call on God and say, okay, Lord, you promised to answer me and deliver me in that situation. Does that make sense? These are comforting words. So he is reconciling all things and returning all things to the original state. Again, they're partial and progressive until the second coming of Christ. At that point in time, all things will be made new. Until then, this earth realm and the world in which we live is in a, a bit of a tension. Again, there's two kingdoms at war, right? The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. But God's kingdom, says in Scripture, of his kingdom there is no end. Of the, Isaiah, out of Isaiah 9, of the increase of his government there is no end. Right? His kingdom and his government is going to continue to grow and expand, and it's going to eventually, at the return of Christ, take over everything that we know. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Not that we shouldn't take care of this present earth, yes, but there will one day be a new heaven and a new earth. Just read the Second Peter and read through the book of Revelation and Isaiah, right? Isn't that comforting? So even though man may... Mess some things up, God promises, I'm going to make all things new. So, God, through His infinite wisdom and mercy, provided not only for the redemption of mankind, but here's an interesting thing, but also for the land. Let's just segue on this a little bit that became cursed due to Adam's sin. Now, God used the cross, a sacred tree, to repair, to repair the breach between heaven and earth that came through the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so, again, Jesus, the second Adam, on that sacred cross, now restores what Adam had lost by going to the wrong tree. Paul describes this truth in Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. Now, that's past tense, isn't it? He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. That's what I said. Positionally, it's already done. We're just walking out the reality of what Jesus has already accomplished. Isn't this good news? Pastor, I'm not perfect. Well, I'm not either. We're a work in progress. So that's why he works all things together for his good, to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So his word helps build us. We grow. The spirit leads us. We grow, right? We, it, because what the enemy is always trying to do is to get us to look at our mistakes and say, okay, there's no way that you can move on from that one. Oh, don't look at me so pious today, okay? <laughs> or he gets us, you may be doing really, really well. But listen, even on your best day, you're still in human flesh, and it's and to get to a place where you're completely Wesley. John Wesley would talk about this entire sanctification where you, you can reach it. Wesley believed you could reach it there momentarily, but not stay there for, for, for very long. I believe that's true, right? We, we, we get very close. Into, have you ever had moments you're on the mountaintop with God, and you just feel so holy like, God, ah, I'm finally there with you and me. Forget everybody else, because I'm caught up in this vision, and it's great. And then the next day, we have a fight with our spouse or with somebody at work or whatever. And then the enemy's like, you're not so holy. (laughs) Right? But the reality is, Christ in us is. But the more that we keep walking towards him... And realizing, no, I can live out of something of the divine nature because I'm made in the image of God. And certainly through faith in Christ, I have been recreated in him back to God's original intent. And that's the hope that all of us have. Otherwise, we have very little hope in this life, right? Through Jesus, the second Adam, God provided a way to restore man in the earth. Adam removed obedience from the tree, but Christ returned obedience to the tree. So how does this affect our lives? How does this affect how we live today? 
Okay, great. So Jesus returned obedience. How does that affect us? We can now eat from the tree of life. <laughs> Come on. Go back and look in Genesis. We can eat from the tree of life. Not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We can live out of the life of Christ, the tree of life now. We can live in a different realm. It's a godly realm. It's a holy realm. It's, it's walking with in the cool of the day, just like Adam and Eve did with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Christ, you and I have been restored to God's original intent justified by faith through Jesus and right relationship with God. Again, you and I are still maturing and growing into the image of Christ as we continue to yield to the Holy Spirit and God's word. But we are in right relationship with God as Adam and Eve were before the fall. And this is scandalous to our human thinking. Don't look at me so pious, okay? Because we look at ourselves in the mirror and we know our faults. We know our mistakes. We know our shortcomings, right? And the enemy loves to keep them on playback. That's why, we're, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, we're to take every thought captive and bring it to the obedience of Christ, right? Because otherwise, we, the enemy will just continually bombard us instead of realizing the truth of what God has done. And again, the early church fathers wanted to make sure through these creeds that the church didn't get off in the weeds and heresy, absolutely. But they also wanted them to be strong, vibrant Christians because they were being persecuted, right? And they wanted the faith to expand. We are called to enforce the reality of Christ's redemption over the earth and society and to help restore our world to God's original intent. That does not mean... We're to have some dominion mindset. It's a very slippery slope here. Some folks get too much into this dominion thing, okay? Yet, we are called to influence. Would you agree? And so the more that we walk in his love, his humility, his grace, right, and that we have mercy for one another and for those outside, you know, in society, and the more we represent Christ, the more then we can influence this world with his world. The more that we pray for the sick, we demonstrate his world breaking into our world. The more that we, we share the good things of Christ and what Christ has done and tell the stories and how God provides and how God heals and how God delivers, how God restores, right? All of this then helps shift the atmosphere in our life and around our cities and our workplaces, et cetera. That's what God's after. So the same, if you will, stewardship that Adam was given now, through Christ, we've been given that as well. And I'll build on that a little bit more next week, right? Uh, now, let's just talk for a minute here as I get kind of start to wrap this up for today. When is the kingdom of God coming? It's already here. But it's also coming. It's both present and it's future. That's the correct answer. Luke 17, verse 20 and 21, uh, the Pharisees asked Jesus a question. When will the kingdom of God come? Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there, for the kingdom of God is already among you. Again, the problem is, they were looking for a political Messiah, Savior, and the overthrow of the Roman government. So they were like, okay, Lord, just tell us, when is this going to happen? When is the tyranny of the Romans going to get overthrown, and we're going to establish this Davidic messianic reign that, that we've known, it's been in the prophets, when is that going to come? And Jesus said, nope, the kingdom's already among you. And again, he demonstrated that. Every sickness that he healed, every disease, every dead person he raised, Right? All of that, demons cast out, all, all the food he multiplied, all the things that he did, all of it demonstrated God's love and the inbreaking of God's kingdom. And so when is God's kingdom coming again? It's present now, and it's also future. Again, the kingdom of God has always been present. Jesus just simply began to demonstrate was a present reality. And I'll build on this more next week 
of Matthew 28, 18, how all authority has been given unto him, and he's now given it to us, right? Now, here's the reality. We're, again, we're supposed to be stewards like Adam was, and until he returns, we're to operate in part of this understanding of the kingdom. Look what Revelations eleven fifteen says. Now, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. So there's going to come a point in time where the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of this world is going to be subservient and crushed underneath the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ in his kingdom. That's it. So in the meantime, we're to operate in this reality that the kingdom is both now present or it's partial, if you will, but it's also future. The kingdom manifests through us partially until he returns, and then at that time, fully. And, you know, just, again, the more that we cultivate an atmosphere of faith, and we're walking closely with the Lord, and, uh, uh, you know, we create an environment of expectancy for his presence, his miracles, his, his, you know, things for him to move, his love, his compassion, his grace, the more that the reality or the fullness of his kingdom is here. And so we can actually help cultivate that in our lives personally, in our families, in our church culture, again, where you work. You can actually help shift the atmosphere where you're at and help bring in a realm of, that, of his presence. And the stronger his presence, the stronger the reality of his kingdom, the more healings you're going to see, the more breakthrough you're going to see, the more restoration, more people coming to Christ, etc. Now, let me just talk for a minute about um, the second coming of Christ. You good? Yeah. All right, I'm going to look at, a, at, at just a couple verses in Matthew 24, verse 36 and 39. Because there's a lot of different views, not a lot, but there's four primary views on what's known as eschatology or the study of the end times. And so I kind of hold a position here at Passion Church, and I teach our leaders, look, hold things kind of loosely, right? In other words... Uh, there's been 2,000 years of church history. There's not complete agreement exactly on how the end times are going to unfold. But there are some things that Jesus made pretty clear. And let's look at these verses. He says, about the day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, just before this, if you look at the verses, he's talking about there'll be wars rumors of wars, there'll be famines, there'll be earthquakes, there'll be all these things going on, right? All this stuff. He goes, don't let your hearts be troubled, you know? Some are going to fall away because of this, all this stuff. He goes, don't, don't, you know, just stay steadfast in what you know about me and, and what I'm doing. He goes, because no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So I don't care how prolific a teacher is on YouTube, in the pulpits around America and around the world and how they've got this 15 steps to when Jesus is going to come and this is, I've got this timeline here in the book of Daniel. I know Daniel's 70th week, etc. No one, everybody said it, no one knows the day or the hour. <laughs> but the Father, hold it loosely. Now, he did say, and again, I don't want to build on this too much, he did say, speaking of there be a generation when you see all these things start to happen know that it's near, okay? We'll leave it at that. But don't get hung up on current events. Don't get hung up on trying to date set. Don't, don't, that, that'll just lead you into the weeds. I have some, I have some Jesus people folks in the room here today. Don't look around, because some of you got really gray hair, okay? And see, there was, I remember, now I'm sort of the tail, Carol and I are sort of the tail end of all that, right? But, when I first came to Christ, about 10 years after the Jesus People Movement, there was still a book around um, called The Late Great Planet Earth. It was a good book. So said. It was a good book, except that it, except that it was a, mostly a lot of fear-mongering, okay? And there was a whole lot of folks that didn't go to college. They didn't plan for retirement. I know some of you are feeling really convicted right now, okay? Because they were so wrapped up that Jesus is coming in any minute. Prominent pastor wrote a book, 
88 reasons he's going to come in 1988. Believe it at that. Don't get hung, hung up in this stuff, right? He goes, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. From the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Amen. It's going to happen quickly. So you don't know what? Just keep your eyes on Jesus, right? Raise, go have kids, families, get married, right? Save for retirement, do all these things. I had someone 20 years ago, we were doing some repairs on the modular out there, literally tell me, and this person, brother, wonderful brother, has passed on, he's with Jesus. He said, Pastor, why are we putting the extra money into the really good siding on the modular when after all, Jesus is coming soon? I'm not exaggerating. I said, well, because I want to be a good steward, so we're going to spend the extra money and put the good siding on there. We did. And guess what? Years went by. Some of that siding rotted out. And I have had one of the other brothers here in the congregation help us repair the whole modular. So we've worked on that modular a couple of times. And guess what? I have a suspicion it'll probably need worked on again. Are you with me? Too many folks get hung up on the current events. Don't let this thing with Israel all of a sudden get you into the weeds. I'm just serious. Oh, don't look so nervous right now, okay? <laughs> Hold it loosely. One simple verse, Matthew 24, verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Everybody good? That's my in-depth teaching on the end times. We don't know exactly when. We just know he's going to come again. That we believe, that's in the creed. We know that he's coming again to rule and reign, and his kingdom will be of no end. Does this make sense, everybody? Would you go ahead and stand? Told you I'd get done early today. I want to just invite the Lord's presence. We had, you know, the message I gave last week was about just abiding in his presence. I just want to invite the Lord's presence to come and, uh, and just see what he wants to do. Is that okay? So, Father, we just thank you for just the reality that your kingdom is here, your kingdom is among us. God, we thank you that of your kingdom there is no end. Jesus, that you are going to return again. And we can have comfort even through the chaos and things that happen in our lifetime and the lifetimes of those behind that have gone before us or those that have come after us. Lord, You've got it all. You've, you're in control. And so, Lord, I'm asking for your presence. I'm asking for your anointing right now. And, God, I, I specifically, I'm asking for a, a strong healing grace to be released right now. Lord, I'm asking you to demonstrate your kingdom through healing for those who need healing in their body. In Jesus' name. So, Holy Spirit, come. Rest right now. If you need healing in your body, just wave your hand. Just you, you and the Lord, just there you go. Holy Spirit, you see each one? I'm asking for your healing presence to come and rest on them. And if you can, just put your hand right where maybe something is troubling you maybe. Holy Spirit, I'm asking for your healing grace to increase, your healing anointing to increase in the name of Jesus. There's, I felt like there was somebody here today that had a gallbladder issue. Is there somebody here that really having a problem with a gallbladder? It's just, is that somebody here? Maybe it's somebody online. Lord, whatever these conditions, Lord, that gallbladder, I just speak healing to that, the pain in the gallbladder, the gallstones go, the inflammation go in Jesus' name. Oh, some, somebody's having their gallbladder removed? Okay, Lord, we just pray for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Any other conditions? There's something, that, it's like in the back, but it's down in the sciatic area of the, of the leg, the right leg. Is that somebody, the sciatic area? Lord, we just speak healing. Just put your hands on that. Holy Spirit, increase your healing presence right now. Just increase your healing presence on that, God, in Jesus' name. Someone, you got upper respiratory. I know there's a lot of that going around. I had some of that this week. Upper respiratory, we just speak healing in Jesus' name. We rebuke virus, colds, COVID, whatever, Lord. We just rebuke it in Jesus' name. Upper respiratory, go in the name of Jesus. Lower back issues. Some, you've had a, like a severe strain in the lower back. 
down into the, it, um, in fact, I believe someone you've actually had uh, something like maybe even fused together down that lower back area. Is that somebody here and you've got like a real problem in that area? Yeah, right, oh Lord, we just ask right now, Charles, Lord, just touch, Lord, let your healing grace just increase right there on that lower back area. Now, if you sense God starting to heal or touch you, you feel, you know, there's improvement, just kind of wave your hand. I'm just curious, you know. Just press in a little bit. Look, here's one of the things about healing. Say, Lord, I thank you that you paid the price for my healing. Lord, I receive it as part of the kingdom in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. There's a, a liver, well, I know Bud's got a liver. We need to pray, keep praying for Bud. He's battling cancer there in the liver, but I sense there's some, someone else that's got a liver condition. Is there somebody else that's got a liver thing going on? Lord, we just pray healing over Bud. We rebuke the cancer in Jesus' name and the liver. But Lord, this, whatever this other liver condition is, we just speak healing, God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Anybody sense anything different? I mean, I know those were kind of shotgun general prayers really fast. Anybody just kind of wave your hand? You sense any heat or difference there as we prayed a little bit? Yeah, Samara, okay. Thank you, God. Yeah, all right, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. How many believe his kingdom is here? <laughs> and he's still healing the sick, right? Amen. All right, so we'll have the prayer team up here. If you want more prayer for healing, any other situation or condition, they'll be here. Again, if you've never given your life to Christ, come on up, let someone pray with you. You guys doing all right? Did this bless you today? Kind of getting into the creeds a little bit? All right, so good. So next week, we'll talk about this we believe about Jesus. We'll get into that a little bit more, amen? And so we got the coffee ministry out there. If you need, get some coffee and fellowship. Go have some fun. We'll have the prayer team here as well, amen.